So you know how I'm always telling you that, and I can't say it enough because it's so true, that when you are having a relationship with someone, and it doesn't matter who it is, but since I love to talk about love relationships, let's talk about love relationships. When you are having a relationship with someone, what you are really doing on a soul level, on an energetic level, and even to a certain extent on a psychological level, is you are having a relationship with yourself through that other person. That other person and the energy between the two of you is a catalyst. It is a catalyst for your expansion and your growth, but it is also a catalyst for your healing. Why? Because you chose whoever you chose, or you will choose whoever you choose, not only because of all their wonderful qualities and characteristics and that you have shared values and a shared vision of the future and you're attracted to them, right? All of those things are true, but you are also choosing them because their baggage goes with yours as that famous line from the musical Rent. I love that song where he he says, I'm looking for someone whose baggage goes with mine. We are attracted to people who are going to trigger our shit, period. It's this little good-natured loving game I play with myself whenever I'm working with a new couple because it doesn't matter who they are or what their presenting issues are. Invariably, without fail, it very quickly becomes apparent to me, and I help them eventually understand this, that the thing that is most bothering them about that other person or the thing causing the most issues in the relationship is actually the reason they chose that person, even though it wasn't conscious and they weren't cognizant of it. So like this easy, simple example is like, let's say, you know, you were abandoned by your father or your mother, one of your key caretakers left or your parents got divorced and then they kind of left your life and married someone else and had a new family, you know, that whole thing where you were literally abandoned, right? Or maybe you were in foster care, or maybe, you know, whatever, you were abandoned as a child and you have a deep abandonment wound. And maybe you've even done a lot of work on yourself and you've done some healing, right? But you say to yourself, I'm never gonna marry someone or be in a deep relationship with anyone who's cheated or abandoned anyone. I wanna make sure that the person I'm with is really loyal. And those are all you know, really important things to look for. And then you end up with someone who has never cheated and is unbelievably loyal and is never gonna leave you or your children that you may have together. But turns out they're a workaholic. Okay, and so they are going to work 24 seven and are basically abandoning you, the family, the relationship for their work. They're not literally abandoning you, but you are re-experiencing abandonment through them. And the reason I have found, and this is on more of a metaphysical level, but you know that I like to work here and I have found this to be true so hugely in my own life, but in the work that I do with so many, that part of the purpose of relationship is it's one of the most powerful paths to healing because when you can start to recognize, oh, this person is abandoning me for their work, right? That's bringing up all these old wounds and triggers that I haven't cleared and healed, all the worthiness wounds, all the self-advocacy wounds, all the willingness to ask for what I need and set down boundaries and expectations and require you know, that someone really show up for me. All of that is coming up to be healed, cleared and stepped into. And so part of the healing of the then relationship as you two work together to set more limits and to start creating more quality time and you start really stepping into your power and getting clear about what you want and deserve and standing for that and requesting that and requiring something different, right? A huge amount of soul healing and inner child healing from the one who was abandoned starts to occur. So this is why every relationship is a soulmate. You know, oh, I'm looking for my soulmate. Every love relationship is a soulmate. Some of them last three weeks, some of them last three years, some of them last 50 years, some of them last a couple of months. They are all soulmates because they are all helping your soul grow. Now, I also want to talk about a caveat with relation to this because I do find that people get a little prickly when I talk about sort of 
holding your boundaries and also not reenacting your wounds, right? So one of the things that I often get in trouble for is when I say that you have to be really aware and be aware of the butterflies, because when you find and, and connect with that love relationship, who is really going to be a keeper in a healthy way and who is really going to be able to heal and grow with you in a loving and supportive organic way. That doesn't mean there aren't going to be wounds and trials and tribulations and issues because there will. That's the whole point. No relationship should really for your sole purpose ever be totally smooth sailing. I always get worried when couples tell me they never, ever, ever fight. I'm like, something's wrong with you guys. You're neither one of you is being totally authentic here, you know, but if you are with or, or starting to be with the person who is really going to be a healthy soulmate, you do not have butterflies in the way most people think of them. The way most people think of them is not a kind of excitement and energized sense. It is the butterflies of anxiety, of graspiness, of, oh my God, you know, is he going to call, call? Is she, does she like me? What's going to happen? Are they going to kiss? You know, there's this real kind of fear. Those butterflies are the body's warning system. When you meet and connect with the lover or the love that is going to be your soulmate, it feels like coming home not in like a boring way of like, oh, I'm coming back home because I got nothing to do, but like the excitement of coming home to your dream house where everything is beautiful and fits and feels whole and safe and fulfilling and passionate and exciting right? But if you are someone who can only feel excitement or only get a charge in drama and scarcity, then you are only going to be attracted to people with whom you have that dramatic sense with. And people get really mad at me when I say that, because the thing they always say to me, especially in the spiritual community, when people get mad at me about this, is they say, well, what about twin flames? You're throwing away the potential of a relationship that's gonna grow your soul or that was your twin flame. You know, it's supposed to be hard. Well, yeah, every relationship is hard if you're both being authentic and honest and vulnerable with each other. And, you know, it's gonna be hard. <laughs> every relationship is hard. Every relationship creates some soul growth and some growth edges and some difficult times. But I find that so often people use this kind of theory of the twin flame to stay in what is a really a toxic and relation, a toxic and even abusive relationship. Oh no, they're my twin flame. So I have to stay with them. My soul signed up for this to be abused or to be, and, or they'll say, well, I, you know, they're this way because of their wounds. They were abused as a child or they never really trusted love. And so you imagine that you're going to be the savior that's going to kind of heal them, right? This sort of hero complex or this healer complex that many of us have. And I'm not saying you shouldn't stay in a relationship if if that's going on and work to maybe create more safety but two conditions must be present if you're going to do that first of all the person that you're doing that with has to be willing to not only use it as an excuse or a fallback well you know i'm just damaged i'm very you know i'm just wounded that's why i'm doing that like okay that's step one right but they also have to be willing to take responsibility and be really engaged in their own healing work and stick with it. Not just say, well, I'll go do this one session, but they really are committed to doing their own healing work. That's number one required. And number two, if you're going to stay in a relationship with someone who isn't showing up with you for you or not treating you the way that you want and deserve because of their own wounds, is you can let that be an excuse for their behavior or an explanation for their behavior. But not if it is emotionally or physically abusive. That is not okay. And I'm not saying that you have to shut them out for the rest of your life, but I definitely don't want you to stay, especially, you know, well, really either emotional or physical abuse because both are extremely damaging. One is physically life-threatening, but both are really seriously long-term damaging. So I want you to pull way back 
and maybe create some distance until that person really shows that they are working on things and sticking with it. It's not enough to say, okay, I'll go to therapy or I'll start working on my healing or I'll go explore this personal growth arena or whatever, or I'll go to these workshops with you. It's that they have to do it and stick with it and really commit to their own personal growth, not for you, although that's part of the fringe benefit, you know, for the sake of the relationship, but for themselves. In those cases, you know, it's okay to stay, but you sometimes have to stay at a distance if things have been really emotionally and certainly if they have been physically abusive. That is not a twin soul. That is a justification to stay in an abusive relationship. And the final thing I want to talk about since I've written this new book about, you know, called You're Not Crazy, You're Just Ascending, about the mass spiritual awakening that is happening globally and in mass right now to so many of us, we don't even realize it's happening, but we are all drastically raising, our vibration is rising collectively because of what's happening on the planet and because of lots of other factors that I get into in the book. And a lot of us are going through a real spiritual awakening. So what happens in your relationship when you go through a spiritual awakening, especially if maybe you're going through an awakening and your partner is not, right? And so when I wrote Quantum Love, one of the things that was so powerful about that discovery for me as I worked with it and wrote about it and learned about it and taught it and worked with couples around it is that when you start to do your own healing, which is really what ascension is, ascension and spiritual awakening, to get there, to move through it, to really start feeling and experiencing the benefits of it is a bumpy ride. You know, that's what ascension, ascension is the spiritual awakening, ascension syndrome, which I help you navigate through in the book, is the bumpy ride of working, of releasing what needs to be released and healing what needs to be healed in order to fully step into your rising. But here's what starts to happen, especially in loving relationships. And I wrote about this extensively in Quantum Love, and you can geek out on the science behind this because I got into it. But basically, more so in love relationships and in family relationships than in any other one, I would say between partners and between parents and children, this is the most significant, is that we are energetically entrained to one another. And what that means is, it's based on quantum entanglement. So we are pure atomic energy. We are made of vibrating atoms. We hold a, vi our bodies hold a vibrational frequency that is constantly shifting and changing. And like I was saying, all of us on the planet, our frequency is higher than it was two years ago because we entrain to the earth. The earth doesn't match us. We're always matching the earth and the earth's energetic frequency for fascinating reasons has risen in recent years. And there are lots of other things going on. But what entanglement means is that if when two Two atoms are entangled. They are spinning, vibrating, exactly the same angle and rate and direction, identical, like two tuning forks that are struck. You know, one is struck and the other matches it. Okay, if I were to take one of those atoms and shoot it to the moon and then take this atom still on, on down here with us and started spinning it in the opposite direction at the same instant, the atom that it's entangled with up in the moon is going to start spinning in the opposite direction as well. Because when we are entangled energetically with each other, which is what happens in love relationships, and there's real science to back this up, as well as with our children, we match. We match each other's energy. So in a relationship, as you start doing your healing work and you start raising your vibration one of two things will happen and you don't have to do anything or make any decisions about your relationship. You just start healing and pay attention to your own spiritual growth and work. And as you do that, your vibration starts rising and you get clearer and you're more capable of setting boundaries because you more viscerally and energetically and emotionally understand how worthy of love you are because you're tapped in and tuned in and you can feel it and you're experiencing it. So it's so much easier to be brave and to set those boundaries and to step up for yourself and to clarify in your own mind and for your partner what you want and need, right? So as you do that, one of two things will happen. Your partner is entangled with you, okay? So 
they, he, she, they, whoever they are, is either going to rise to me, to your, your frequency because you're holding this frequency. You're not matching your partner anymore. You're working on your own energetic frequency and your own healing and you're holding that frequency, which is what I teach you in Quantum Love. And as you do that, your partner starts to match you there because they you're not matching them. They have no choice. They're not even conscious of it. They're matching you. But in order to do that, they have to face some of their own stuff. Just by virtue of their frequency rising, they have to let go of some of the density. So some of their old wounds will start coming to consciousness and they'll start feeling a little ungrounded and they'll start acting out a little bit. And, and you may have to hold that boundary more firmly. But what happens is either they do that and they rise to meet you and they match you and they will at astounding rates. I'm always amazed, even in my own life. I never expect someone to actually be able to match me. I'm thinking, oh God, there's no way this, you know, there's no way this is going to, you know, I, I'm not sure what's going to happen in this relationship now that I'm in this new place. And invariably I'm surprised by how those close to me rise to meet me. And in other people's relationships, I see the same thing. So very, very often, I would say the majority of the time, your partner will match you. And if you just hold your own frequency and work on your own stuff, they will rise to meet you. And you'll be amazed at how much better things get. Or if that doesn't happen, you have done so much healing and have so much more of like a meta above the trees view of the whole forest. And you can see things so clearly and you understand your worth so much more completely that the fear of leaving a relationship that is no longer serving you is not nearly as great as the pain of staying in the constriction of the unhealthy relationship. So either your partner will rise with you or it will just be very clear that it's time to move on and it won't be the scary, impossible idea that it feels like now. You know, it will feel very clear to you when that time comes. So you don't have to worry about it. All you have to do is work on your own ascension. Be a model of that. Hold that energetic frequency of healing. Do your own healing work and set your boundaries and clarify your needs and wants and require how you want to be treated in a healthy, loving way. And your partner will either rise to meet you or eventually it will just be very, very clear. But either way, it's win-win really for all parties involved, because if your partner can't ascend with you or rise with you, not only are they not the right partner for you, but you aren't the right partner for them anymore. They now are in a much denser place than you. And they either, if they're not willing to rise with you, they need to find someone who can match their density, right? It's not your job to sink your frequency to their level and constrict yourself and make yourself small, right? It's your job, not only for yourself and your soul, but for the planet to continue to rise, okay? So I hope that gives you some insights into how to work with this in your relationship, how to look at soulmates, how to look at twin flames, and how to start exploring how ascension is going to play out in your relationship. And make sure to check out my book, You're Not Crazy, You're Just Ascending, How to Thrive and Survive or Survive and Thrive in This Wild New World. It's available uh, as an as an ebook, as a digital book, as well as an audio book on my website, drlauraberman.com. And if you like this video and if you want me to make more, make sure to comment, make sure to subscribe because you know I'm always here to help you learn to love and be loved better.